Hello and good evening. On behalf of the British Council and all of our fantastic partners, I would like to welcome you very warmly to the FameLab Ireland Final 2015! Funny, my note says, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Can we try that again? Fame that Ireland final 50, 2015! <laughs> That's the sort of enthusiasm we would like from you this evening because we're going to be witnessing something very special. We're going to be witnessing scientists who are wearing their hearts and their sleeves and doing something that doesn't necessarily come easy to a scientist. So we're looking for lots of your enthusiasm here tonight. My name is Jonathan McRae, I'm the presenter of Future Proof on News Talk 106 to 108. I'll be your MC for the evening. Uh, now these talks are three minutes long. The idea of FameLab is to get scientists to break the, the barrier between the public and the scientific lab and, and basically embrace the idea of storytelling. Tonight is about uh, entertainment, drama and suspense. Uh, what we're looking to do is see scientists talk about a scientific idea for just three minutes. Um, and that three minutes is pretty tight. It's very difficult sometimes for someone to nail down a very, very complex idea into just three minutes, but that's what we're asking our finalists here to do. Uh, we have 11 finalists. Um, we had an international competition. You may notice a common thread in terms of the location of our, our finalists, but uh, it was open to the country. It just happens that everybody uh, who made the final is from Dublin and Cork. That's how it goes. I could, I could bore you with statistics. I'm sure there's some statisticians here who could bore you much better than I. Uh, but that's the way it is. So um, they've got three minutes. 2.30, we'll raise the hand. Uh, and at three minutes, we'll, uh, we'll honk the horn. Liz, do you want to honk the horn so people know? That means you've gone over time, and that is the Horn of Death. Seems a strange name for it, a little bit over the top, I think, Horn of Death. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome you all here, particularly those who are watching for the first time streaming at home. Woo! Yeah. I hope, uh, if you are watching this from home, that you do have a good internet. <laughs> you ruined it. Uh, okay, so uh, let's get to the finalists. We have three judges here tonight, uh, esteemed panel indeed. Um, uh, they will be judging our contestants. They will deliberate for approximately 15 to 20 minutes after we see, hear all of the 11 talks. Uh, and let me introduce them to you. The first is Jenny Hill. She's from CPL. Uh, and she has been employed by CPL Science and Engineering since 2012 as a senior recruitment consultant specializing in temporary and contract assignments. Jenny recruits for some of the largest pharmaceutical clients in Ireland. Uh, prior to joining CPL, Jenny completed a BSc in for forensic and environmental chemistry, which I didn't know you could do. Um, if you impress Jenny, you might get a job. Uh, Clara Connell, uh, Dr. Clara Connell, is a scientist turned writer. She is a PhD in cell biology uh, from UCD and worked as a postdoc in Glasgow and Sydney before leaving the lab to become a writer and then became the journalist we all know and love. Uh, she has been contributing to the Irish Times for a decade and is a regular contributor to SiliconRepublic.com. She's written for New Scientist, Nature, Scientific American, all the good stuff. Um, she holds a master's in science communication from DCU, where she's an associate lecturer, and if you impress her tonight, uh, you might get famous. <laughs> Niall Smith received his PhD in astrophysics from UCD in 1990. God, that was a long time ago, Niall, wasn't it? Uh, he was appointed as the first head of research at Cork Institute of Technology. He's also a principal scientist at the Black Rock Castle Observatory uh, and is a member of the International Astronomical Union uh, and several national committees. He is chair of the local organizing committee for the International Space University Summer Space Program, which will take place in CIT in 2017. So if you impress him, he might bring you into another galaxy. Uh, okay, please welcome them all to the stage. These are our judges. <laughs> Okay, are we all ready? Then let's begin. Um, our first contestant is Donald Earls. Donald completed his undergraduate degree in physics in Trinity College Dublin. is currently undertaking uh, a first year professional master's in education with a major in physics and junior science. Donald loves giving people an insight into how things work through science. Well, actually, he says he mostly loves just taking the magic out of rainbows. But in ruining the magic for everyone, he thinks he's making those rainbows just that bit more fascinating. Other than this, Donald has a love of running and yoga. Please welcome to the stage, Donald Earls! Something happened in 2001 that significantly changed the world. 
the release of Lord of the Rings. Now, 11-year-old me saw this nine times in the cinema. Something happened during the start of this movie that really grabs your attention. You see Gandalf and Bilbo there blowing smoke rings together. I thought this was awesome. So I went out, I figured out how it was done and why it happens, and I thought I'd share that with you all here today. So, how do you blow a smoke ring? This happens when you blow a burst of air through a small opening, our mouth in this stage, with a great amount of force. As this, um, the air passes over the edge of the opening, it gets slowed down from friction, just on the outside of your lips. But the air in the middle stays at roughly the same speed. So, let's focus in on the top of our lip here. What happens right here? A small little whirlpool-like phenomenon occurs. This is because the air on the inside is spinning much, much quicker than the air on the outside because of that friction that slows it down. And this stabilizes the whole ring. Now, because this is happening the whole way around our mouth at the same time, we get our smoke ring. This ring is made up of these little whirlpools, as I just said, or vortexes. So we can call them vortex rings, which I think sounds so much cooler. So now we have our fancy smoke ring. How does it get from A to B? So, first of all, I have to get you guys to imagine this whole, all the air in this room is perfectly still. OK, we've done that, fantastic. Now, on the top of our smoke ring, the air is turning counterclockwise, and on the bottom, it's turning clockwise. So, all the air here and here is perfectly still, and the ring actually drags itself along. So you guys don't actually don't have to do any work at all. Lucky for you all. So, the other day I found out something really annoying. Dolphins can actually blow their own smoke rings using their blowholes, and they didn't have to go through four years of college physics to work that out. <sighs> so, however, a little time after that, I, worked, I found out something much more interesting. I have been creating these vortex rings from since I was really, really young. Now, I'm not saying my parents made me smoke. No, 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 no. Every time your heart beats, a tiny little vortex ring is created in the left chamber. So, unlike Frodo, who set out to destroy a ring, our journey here today was to discover out how we make these rings and why they happen. And the answer has been inside all of you this whole time. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and now it's uh, questions and comments from our judges. Well done. That was very informative. I uh, love the props. Did you make them yourself? I did. It's well just uh, one euro from the art and hobby shop. I know Excellent. our college <laughs> missed me. Excellent. Um, can I ask you, how much of this information did you know before from your studies of physics, and how much did you have to research for research. this actual um, I knew a little bit of them from my physics degree. I did a similar talk, and actually in my second year, we had a similar kind of talking point that we had to do something outside our normal studies area. So you get some information on friction and those kind of things in your physics degree, but then you apply them to a bigger area of moving of fluids, which is a little bit funny. So I didn't know a lot, but I knew certain things. So yeah. Can I ask a kind of a silly question? Yeah. Why can't I blow smoke rings? Probably, you know, four years of physics and practice is the other side, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I did build an actual smoke ring blower, but for self and he self health and safety reasons, I couldn't bring it here today. So you can if you just practice loads. That's the, the main aim. <laughs> so is there a stability issue at your yeah. mouth? Does it matter? Uh, yeah, it's not, if it's not perfectly circular, it doesn't form it properly, so there'll be a little instability here and it'll break apart early, or if you're not doing a sharp enough burst, it, can, it won't you know, get that enough friction to cause the perfect vortex ring and make that kind of Bernoulli principle, which is that fast and low speed that causes that vortex to properly stabilize. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, yeah. What makes you passionate about this subject that makes you want to share it with the public? Um, well, my Lord of the Rings example, most definitely. <laughs> I can't blow boats like Gandalf yet, but I'm working on it. Um, no, it's, it's just kind of seeing something that looks really simple or really complicated to someone, and then breaking down why that works and kind of going, okay, this is a big challenge to, number one, do is blowing a smoke ring, but then the understanding of it's totally out there, and they're still kind of working it out, so it's that there's still answers you can't find, but explaining little things will be a step towards kind of greater understanding, and, you know, ruining rainbows is another thing, so. <laughs> Yeah. Donal Lerles, everyone. Thank you. Donal.
Lisa is a first-year PhD student in applied psychology at University College Cork. Her research lies in the broader health of health psychology. Uh, Lisa is interested in an individual's time orientation and how it influences how they make decisions. Uh, Lisa is passionate about communicating science effectively, and outside of research, she likes to sing and play the guitar. Uh, she'll be putting a scientific spin on taking a selfie. And how do you know that Lisa Murphy's from Cork? Oh, she'll tell you. <laughs> Lisa Murphy! So, we've all been there, guys. Had that moment when you're faced with 15 selfies and you're trying desperately to decide which one is the one. The Facebook profiler. The selfie that could break the internet. And we may think that our decision is based on how luscious our lips look or how flawless our skin looks. But in fact, there is another critical facial feature. One that we don't even know we're looking for. Symmetry. As well as evolving to be a love machine and a memory card, our brain is a symmetry detector. After we've taken a selfie, like our one here, <laughs> our eyes immediately scan the facial features in the photo. And this image is then projected into the visual processing centers of our brain, right here at the back of the head. It is here where our brain begins a rapid and effective process of beauty detection, whereby even the tiniest deviations from perfect symmetry are identified. The nose, for example, might be angled slightly to the left. But the less deviations identified, the more symmetry you detect. And then suddenly, the reward centers of your brain begin to fire. You have found the selfie where your face is positioned at that perfect angle. The selfie where you have simulated perfect symmetry. And you are scientifically beautiful. And we've seen it time and time again. Despite age and despite culture, we show an overwhelming preference for symmetrical faces. Take, for example, the woman who has just published a book of selfies, Kim Kardashian. With superb facial symmetry, Kim is consistently rated as one of the most beautiful women in all of the world. So, symmetry equals beauty. But why does it even matter to us? Like, when's the last time you walked past an attractive guy or girl on the street, turned to your best friend and whispered, God, they are so symmetrical-like. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it matters because whether we're on Tinder or in Temple Bar, our primary purpose in life is to pass on our genes. So as we're searching for that special someone on a Saturday night, we are in fact searching for that someone who can provide the best genetic material for our future baby. But because we can't just slide up next to somebody in coppers and ask to see their genetic code, we instead rely on what we can see, which is how their genes are expressed. And one of the best indicators of this is facial symmetry. It is because, by and large, our genes are such that the human face is designed to develop symmetrically. But as we grow in the womb and throughout childhood, environmental stress, infections and disease disrupt the expression of our genes, resulting in tiny facial imperfections called asymmetries. Therefore, scientific beauty is far more than skin deep. It is an indicator of our genetic fitness and a strong, healthy immune system. And now, with the invention of the selfie, our symmetry detectors can not only help us to show our beautiful faces to the world, but they help us to advertise our healthy genes. So remember, the next time you're taking that all-important Facebook profiler, don't say cheese, say symmetry. <laughs> well done, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, one of our judges got to say. Well, I have I a couple of questions, question. but I'll just ask you one. Yeah, oh, actually, yeah. You, you look a bit threatening yielding the <laughs> selfie stick, I have to say. So I might change the question. So <laughs> yeah. is there a correlation then between how long you live and how symmetric your face is in terms of the strength of your genes or, you know, in, or, or, or actually how good you are at procreating? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, would you actually believe um, that was one of the questions that I was kind of thinking might come up? I was trying to make a little list for myself and I couldn't find one study that looked at it. Um, so what I did was I, I kind of popped into my supervisor yesterday. I was like, look, there's this thing that I haven't found. Um, and I think it would be such an interesting study to do, but I couldn't find anything on it. I would imagine with all the correlations between kind of physical health, um, symmetry and beauty that we might find something. So we're starting that next summer, actually. <laughs> And, and when did you get the idea to do 
this oh. particular talk? Were you looking at a picture of Brad Pitt or something? Going yeah, to- every <laughs> night. <laughs> um, no, actually, me and a few of the girls um, wanted to go on holidays there a few um, months ago. Well, we wanted to go to Kinsale. And we were like, look, for the crack, we'll just find a selfie stick. Um, and I literally went to every... I'm from Cork, obviously. <laughs> and um, I literally... I t- I t- you said that I was told you. Anyway, I literally went to... Um, I went to every place that I could possibly find in Cork and they were all sold out. And every person that I went up to said, we don't have them. They came in in their hundreds and they're gone. So I was like, what? What is this? Like, what's, what is it with the selfies? And like, when I go onto my Facebook, it's just constant selfies, selfies the whole way down. And I started to think, because obviously I'm a psychologist, I started to think like, there must be something in it. And this was the thing that jumped out at me. I actually, I have a comment really on the, this facial symmetry. Yeah. They did a study where they actually say half your face and gave you both sides mm-hmm. and it was actually a much less attractive version of the person. Yeah. Have uh, you seen that yet? I have, yeah. I've came with this, so there's quite a few different studies, um, like if you put it into PsychInfo, that would pop out. And the difference between all of them is the methodology. So there are some studies, about half of them haven't found the connection and I, between, say, beauty and symmetry. And th- I was like, there must be a reason for this. So if you look at the methodologies, about half of these studies do exactly that, so that they take an image, they cut it in half, and then they put the left with the left and the right with the right, and they show people the images and see if there's a difference in attractiveness ratings. But what the studies that find the relationship between beauty and symmetry tend to do is that they morph it, they, they use kind of morphing software, they smoothen out the skin, and they make it look like a natural face. Because if you're actually looking at two like perfect left-hand sides of the face, it's not a natural thing for us to look at. Whereas when we actually like smooth it out, smooth out the skin tone into what looks like a face that you'd see on the street, that's when they find the relationship then. Lisa Murphy, everyone. Yeah. Can I do selfies? Yeah. Can I see the Oscars, come on. Can this way, come on. Oh yeah, we totally win. Okay. We're just going to do a, a, an just Oscar a selfie. Just a quick one. This is my first selfie. I'm not because I'm old, I just think it's not. Okay, so there's two seconds on it, but it takes about three. So, so everyone stay still. Hey, stay still, okay. You look kind of scared there, John. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Murphy, for everyone. Uh, Jennifer Largan studied zoology at Trinity College Dublin for her undergraduate degree and is currently a student on the MSc in bioengineering, specialising in tissue engineering. She's a part-time mediator in the science gallery, so has a bit of a home, ad- home advantage. And she's looking forward to a captive audience to talk about science. Her words, not mine. Uh, when not talking about science, Jennifer knits, runs and volunteers with the SVP, not at the same time. Uh, please put your hands together for Jennifer Largan. Between 1918 and 1920, Spanish influenza killed 50 million people, more than three times as many as were killed in the First World War. Viruses are far more efficient at killing us than we are. Not that anyone's keeping score. And so it might sound a bit counterintuitive when I say I firmly believe that viruses are going to hugely improve life for a great many people. It's not because I'm a misanthropist hoping for a plague or a zombie apocalypse. I don't think I'd do very well in either situation but because the mechanism that makes viruses so effective is far more elegant than anything that we could design ourselves. Viruses are parasites. They can't survive without a host. And they're extremely clever parasites. They don't latch onto the skin like ticks or fleas. They don't grow within tissue like bacteria. The way a virus protects itself is to make itself a part of you. When a virus enters your body, it acts like a syringe. It injects its its genes into your cell. These genes then get incorporated into your DNA. And when that infected cell divides, the viral genes get copied along with your own. But we can parasitize our parasites. We can remove the disease-causing viral genes and introduce human genes that can then get injected into a human host as normal. Now, you might be wondering why bother introducing human genes into a human. It seems a bit redundant. Far from it. It's a way of saving your body from itself. If you have a genetic disease, it's a way of treating your condition at its root. Instead of going through a lifetime of transplants, therapy, medication, you can have a healthy copy of the gene introduced to your body, and then, like the viral genes, you have it for life. If you've heard the term gene therapy, or viral gene therapy, this is what it refers to. One of the, one of the conditions for which this holds most promise is called bubble baby disease, or more clinically, severe combined immunodeficiency disorder. Patients with this rare disease have a malformation in the cells that are responsible for fighting infection. 
Essentially, you don't have an immune system. Infants who are born with this disease have to be kept in a perfectly sterile environment, can only interact with medical personnel or family members when they're wearing protective equipment, and they usually die of infections within the first year of life. It seems like an insurmountable problem to fix. The immune system isn't a structure that you can transplant. It's not a chemical that you can supplement. It's a complicated network of organs and chemicals. How are you meant to recreate that with nothing to work with? If the answer to that question weren't gene therapy, this would be a really badly planned talk. But <laughs> luckily it is. So, so since, two, since 1999, 17 patients in different clinical trials have had their immune systems fully restored by gene therapy. That's 17 children who get to feel the sun on their skin, 17 families whose hearts don't stop at the sound of every cough, the sight of every scratch. When I stood up, I said that I believe viruses are going to improve life for a great many people. And that was a bit of a lazy statement. It's not a very bold claim to say you believe something that's already happened. Thank you for listening. Jennifer Morgan. Very good, and over to our panel. Yeah, I do. I have a question. Okay. Do you see any challenges with the hot topic of anti-vaccination? Do you see challenges coming with the gene therapy, trying to communicate that effectively? Well, I think there have, even without this, the anti-vaccine movement, there have been problems with gene therapy. For example, because the viruses that have been used so far tend to insert randomly into the genome, they can, they can disrupt genes, because it's like sticking a bunch of letters into the middle of the word. It, it ruins the meaning of it. And this has resulted in, in some patients in the clinical trials develop, developing leukemia. Actually, of 20 patients, four developed leukemia. Three were, uh, three were successfully treated with chemotherapy, but that's still an unacceptably high rate. Now, in 2013, there was a study with uh, five infants under the age of one, and all of those successfully developed immune systems. So I didn't include those in the 17 because, they haven't, because it's so recent, they haven't done sufficient follow-up studies to know if it's if it is effective long term. But so far, none of them have shown adverse effects. So it's possible that this new method is a bit more stable. Um, well done, that was a really clear talk. You. Uh, you mentioned one particular condition which is thankfully rare, and obviously the viral gene therapy has helped enormously. Can you tell us about a few other conditions where people are exploring using viral gene therapy to help overcome some sort of genetic deficit? Um, Yes, well, it's been used to treat congenital blindness. It's been used to treat blood disorders where previously uh, the only available treatment was trans uh, transplants, a series of transplants and transfusions. And I say it is generally only, because of the risks associated with it, it's generally only used for life threatening conditions or extremely severe conditions. So. Just a quick question uh, Do you see any ethical issues associated with, with gene therapy? Um, I'm really thinking about maybe about rather than curing people who are evidently ill, improving people who, who aren't. Yeah, I suppose the risk is heading towards a Gattaca type world where people start selecting for what they think is the optimum. And I think once you start trying to engineer people, you're heading towards eugenics, which is obviously, it hasn't gone well any time it's been tried in the past. <laughs> maybe this is the year. <laughs> Jennifer Lorigan, everyone. <laughs> Rory Robertson graduated from UCD with a degree in human nutrition, surviving four years as the only male in a class full of women. Uh, he is now a third year PhD student in nutrition and microbiology at UCC. Uh, Rory's passion for food and nutrition has brought him to all corners of the world to carry out research from Boston to Melbourne to Madagascar, uh, which has simultaneously sparked a love for travel. His current PhD research is trying to make seaweed the next superfood, and he cooks a mean lasagna. His talk is about your first coat. Rory Robertson, everyone. Think back to your childhood and try to remember your first coat. You wore your first coat when you were just a few seconds old, and it may have determined your health for the rest of your life. As a baby inside your mother, you had lovely five-star accommodation, room and board, all-inclusive. Until one day you were dragged from your perfect home, kicking and screaming, like a millionaire lawyer getting evicted from his Kalani mansion. <laughs> and it was at this point that you wore your first coat. This coat wasn't designed by Gucci or Armani, it was designed by Mommy. See, inside the womb, you lived in a sterile environment, 
And when you, uh, when you gave birth or when you were born, the first living things that you met were the millions of friendly bacteria living in your mother's birth canal, which coated you as you emerged into this world. This bacterial coat grew, forming a two kilogram invisible organ in your gut and on your skin, which now does more for you than all the rest of your organs combined. Your bacteria fight infection. They develop your immune system. They even digest your food. Living without bacteria, you wouldn't survive. I'm telling you this because times have changed. There are less and less mothers designing their child's first coat. Now, for one in three children, their first coat is picked at random. For a child born by C-section, they don't receive the natural bacteria that they get in their mother's birth canal. Instead, the first bacteria that they are coated with is any bacteria that's found on the mother's skin, the doctor's hands, or anything in the surgery room. And as this bacterial organ grow, grows, it may digest food, fight infection, or develop the immune system differently. So much so that C-section children now have a 25% increased risk of juvenile arthritis, asthma, or obesity. Through increasing C-sections and a massive overuse of antibiotics, we have begun to tamper with our relationship with bacteria, which may be harming our health and our children's health. But research from my lab is trying to confront this challenge. For years, it was a mystery exactly which bacteria were transferred from mother to child until recently. By examining bacterial DNA, we have identified the bacterial threads that make up the coat, meaning now that we can create and design a new coat which could be given to C-section children to mimic a natural birth in order to try and reduce the risk of such chronic diseases. The relationship between microbe and man is closer than we ever imagined. For our health, and the health of our children, we need to redesign the coat of life. Thank you very much. Well done, that's an absolutely fascinating subject. Um, just wanted to ask you, has anybody looked at the meconium? This is the, the poop, let's face it, uh, that, that's done by babies in the womb to see... Sorry, you said poo, just so everyone can hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Will I spell it for you? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, has anybody looked at that poo in the womb uh, to see whether or not babies actually have bacteria in their intestines before they're born? It's a very interesting question, and it's a very recent thing. Actually, only last year there was a study published which suggested that actually there might be some, at least one or two bacteria that could cross the placenta. And so there's further research looking at um, the placenta to see if there's any bacteria in there as well. But it's a, a very new idea because this theory has been around for you know, hundreds of years that we're sterile inside the womb, but it is a possibility that maybe some can cross the placenta, um, which could have implications for, for further health. But um, yes. Well, I'm eminently unqualified for this next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So I'm a physicist and I've never given birth. <laughs> but I was wondering, it just strikes me, what's the, the, the resilience of this coat? Like, it just, I would by default think it gets washed off very quickly. So it's, it's longevity on the skin is, is sort of minutes, hours or whatever. So how, how does that, does that get absorbed? What's the process? Is there an additional process then? Well, no, as I said, we all have up to two kilograms collectively of bacteria both on us and inside us. So it's more so the bacteria in your gut, known as your gut microbiota, which has the biggest effects for all these things, your immune system, um, your digestion of foods, and even it's uh, been linked to brain health, which is a very a new area. And it does this by uh, interacting with your intestinal cells and uh, maintaining the integrity of, uh, of your intestine, so which can uh, you know, allow infections in or out, or there's different types of bacteria that digest different types of foods in different ways or di digest medicines. So uh, on your skin in general, um, yes, like it, it is a kind of uh, a kind of plastic organ in such that it can fluctuate and, and change in its, um, in its composition. But in general, we all revert back to our own personalized microbiota um, after, after some changes. So it is kind of stable. Uh, I was going to say, get your coat, Rory, but that'd be pretty gross. <laughs> Rory Robertson, everyone! Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Tracy Jane Cassidy is a hardworking single mom of three young children. Uh, she's a passion for science communication and a strong work, ec work ethic. She is a founder of Junior si Einstein's Science Club, an innovative science communication initiative which aims to bring a love of science and learning to primary school aged children. Uh, Tracy Jane has an MA in Natural Science from Trinity as well as an MSc in me Medical Microbiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her talk is about perfor... perfor, perfor it's about a worm. Tracy Jane Cassidy, everyone. <laughs> This is a dark story about a hero and his journey, consisting of zombies, vampires, and a heinous threesome that would make even Mr. Christian Grey bulk. <laughs> Our hero, the doctor, leaves his hospital and heads out into nature's underworld on an adventure to a freshwater pond, the dwelling place of a spiny-headed parasitic worm. Now here's the zombie bit. In a devious ploy that would impress even a villain like Frank Underwood, the spiny-headed worm hijacks an innocent shrimp. Now, the parasitic infection of the shrimp by the worm actually changes the shrimp's behavior. So it, in three ways, it alters the shrimp's sense of smell, so it doesn't detect the fish. It brightens the shrimp's color so that it is more conspicuous to the fish. It also changes the shrimp's aversion to light, so the shrimp will swim up to the open, dark, bright waters. So, like an extra in The Walking Dead, the zombie shrimp will head on a suicide mission right into the jaws of the fish. Inside the fish, the spiny-headed worm hooks onto the intestine. Its cactus-like head swells up, locking it into place. It sucks the nutrients from the fish, like a vampire. So there we have our threesome. The zombie shrimp, the vampire worm, and the unfortunate fish host. Our doctor hero, out in the majesty of nature, thinks he might be onto something. So he takes on this challenge that he is going to imitate the tactics of the spiny-headed worm. And being a brilliant visionary, he succeeds. He creates a patch with the same mechanism as the hook on the head of the spiny-headed worm to attach skin grafts to human patients. This, imagine a bed of tiny needles, each one like an ice cream cone shape, plastic and rigid. The bottom tip is made of the same material as in a baby's nappy, so it swells up on contact with moisture. It swells up like an arrowhead and locks tightly into place. This is perfect for vulnerable, wet, traumatized tissue caused by trauma from cancer, or burns, or infection. So, it's three and a half times stronger than surgical sutures or staples. It reduces the risk of infection, and it's easily and gently removed once the skin has taken hold. So our hero, the doctor, rides off into the sunset with his stories of vampires and zombies. And he takes with him the knowledge from nature that he has gained to create a medical breakthrough that will save lives. But what about our villain, the spiny-headed worm? Well, he came good in the end. The lovable rogue lent us his diabolical secrets so that we can make advancements in science and medicine. Thank you, Jane, everyone. Thank you. Okay, our judges. Well done, Tracy Jane. That was a great, a great talk. Um, what <laughs> Thank is you. this worm's name? Who's the hero here? It's Poor yeah, for Hinkus Lavius. Jonathan. Poor for Hinkus Lavius. Um, poor for Hinkus exactly. And there are many, many parasites that act in this way. What fascinates me is the biomimetics or the biomimicry, the copying of something that already exists in nature, um, and then taking the best parts of that to use in our own processes. And was this worm well studied before this particular It actually really out? was well studied. And only a year ago they discovered, um, actually it was Dr. Balhauf, um, who was from the University of Bonn, he discovered very, for the very first time the fact that this uh, worm manipulated the sense of smell of the shrimp because there are lots of types of manipulations that have mainly to do with lipids and glycogens, but actually this is the first time they've ever discovered that it can manipulate the sense of smell. 
And has this been commercialized or is it still at early stages? It's, to, it's being used now. And in fact, um, this doctor, Dr. Carp, I left his name out so it doesn't get too confusing, <laughs> the fish. <laughs> but um, Dr. Carp actually is brilliant. He runs the Carp Laboratory at the Women's Hospital in Boston. And he um, has, is using it. He hasn't used it yet internally but he intends to, especially for tendons and ligaments, also for patching um, holes in heart and the intestine. Um, and he's just an amazing man. He's also um, made some bandages, which are modeled on the gecko's feet. So you can use it on very elderly skin and on baby skin, so it doesn't really damage it when it rips off. He's also looking at needles based on porcupine quills at the moment. Mm. Tracy Jane Cassidy, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Anya's uh, relationship with science became official when she began studying science in Trinity College Dublin, but they'd been close long before that. Uh, she has home turf advantage as well, because uh, since graduating with a degree in physics, she worked as a mediator too here in Science Gallery Dublin, and she's very happy here, in case anyone's listening. Uh, her talk is about conduction, so it's about to get hot in here. Please refrain from disrobing. Give it up for Anya Flood! <laughs> When I clap my hands, a vibration is produced that we hear as sound, and I can also feel as heat. This heat transfers from the molecules of air around my hands to the other molecules in the room, by one molecule passing on the vibrations to the next. It is these vibrations that allow heat to move. So just like sound, heat needs a medium to travel through. This is why, in a vacuum like outer space, nobody can hear you scream and also how the vacuum between the walls in your thermos flask keep your soup hot. Atoms are made up of a centre, or nucleus, surrounded by electrons, which are negatively charged particles. When an atom or molecule vibrates with heat energy, it's mainly these small electrons that are vibrating. The heat radiates out in all directions, and we have no way to control the directionality of these vibrations that transfer heat, or to control how fast heat moves through a particular medium, until now. As I mentioned, electrons have a negative electrical charge, which means that they are susceptible to influence by electrical forces. Magnetic and electric forces interact with and influence each other. So perhaps these movements of electrons can also be influenced by magnets. This is a thought that occurred recently to a group of researchers in the Ohio State University in the US with some very interesting results. They took a sample of a semiconductor, indium antimonide, at a temperature of 5.2 Kelvin, which is about minus 268 degrees Celsius, and applied a strong magnetic force across it. By doing this, they found that they could control the movement of heat through the sample. The magnetic force slowed down the vibration of the electrons within the molecules of indium antimonide, greatly reducing the transfer of heat energy from one molecule to another. This is a new concept, but just think of all the possible applications. Much of our energy production currently relies on transferring heat to mechanical or electrical energy. And if we can have this control over heat conduction, we could greatly increase the efficiency of this process. If we could control the direction and even the speed of heat conduction, we could produce new, highly efficient cooling systems for engines and for computer processors. This groundbreaking research is still in the very early stages, but it has an enormous potential to revolutionize the many areas that rely on heat transfer and conduction. This is an avenue that is definitely worth pursuing and could produce results that in the future would lead to a lot more claps. Thank you. Well done, Anya. So, guys? So, yeah, so fascinating. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, one of the things, uh, renewable energies, we all know, often don't produce energy when you want it, and they produce more when you don't, and so forth, so storage becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Any comment on how this might affect uh, storage of, uh, of, of renewable energy? Well, the first one that springs to mind is solar energy, which are energy that can easily be stored as heat. 
this isn't always the most efficient because heat leaks out and reduces and it's very difficult to keep it all in one place. But with this technology, potentially, like I say, it's very new. If we could control the heat and keep it all in one place, that would be a pretty big deal and would be able to store more energy so that when the renewable energy isn't supplying energy when you want it, then you could use your store. And just as a quick follow-up, uh, do you know, have they looked at sort of radiative loss of the energy from the electrons that they're still jiggling about so do they sort of still dump some of their energy in other ways um well they did it in a semiconductor obviously in it's not very relevant for metals because they conduct heat so quickly but they're hoping that this is relevant for all other solids like glass or wood or something like that but uh, it's it's still very early stages they're they're looking into it more well done, Anya. Now, I'm, I'm not a physicist, so this could be a daft question. Um, but no such thing. <laughs> well, you, no, might, there is you might just put <laughs> one out here. Um, in ter like, obviously, uh, you know, the, the goal of improving how we use energy sources and store energy is great, but I want to know is, will I have to plug this in every night when this works? You know, how is it going to affect things like consumer electronics stuff we use every day? Yeah, this is, that's actually a really good question. So a lot of the time, the uh, efficiency of these things, like computer processors, are actually determined by the heat, because they overheat. Um, huge processing plants, computer plants, have to be in cold areas, and they have to constantly be cooled. So it's not that we can't put the electrics together to work faster, it's that they overheat. So yeah, that could really make a big application. We could improve the chips, processor chips inside these devices, if we can control the heat. Uh, Put your hands together and conduct an energy for <laughs> Anya Flood. Thank you very much. As well as having the best name ever, uh, Travis Davis is interesting in that he comes from nowhere, the middle of it, uh, specifically in South Dakota. Uh, Travis is an engineer. After five years and six internships, he completed his undergraduate in 2013 as a mechanical engineer. He became a propulsion engineer full-time at NASA before deciding he needed to know more about engineering. So Travis crossed the ocean and started a master's here in Trinity in Japanese culture and history. No, just kidding, it was engineering. Uh, he's currently looking at alternatives for coronary artery bypass grafts. Travis spends his free time riding motorcycles, being American outdoors, and trying to convince people he's not as nerdy as he seems, although he is here to talk about going to Mars, so in essence, he's failed already. Uh, I say embrace the nerd, and uh, please welcome Travis Davis. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. JFK, 1962, <laughs> great man. He challenged the American people to go to the moon in less than a decade. 1969, we had set foot on the moon. Today, 2015, 46 years later, we haven't made it to Mars yet. 2012, we did land an SUV-sized rover on Mars. Touche to us. But we haven't set foot on Mars yet. In the two and a half years that I worked at NASA as a propulsion engineer, I constantly got the question, why have we not went back, why have we went, not went to Mars? Why don't we have people there? Usually from my brother. <laughs> and the, one of the first things is, is distance. So when we went to the moon, uh, this is a 195 million scale. This is our moon and this is our Earth. And that's about the distance, 384,000 kilometers away. And this is our Mars. Now, if this building were 50 stories and I put this ball on the roof, that's how close Mars and the Earth are at their closest points. 50, uh, 46 million miles away. 401 million miles, or kilometers away, sorry, is uh, the distance at their farthest points. Now, the distance is a big problem because it rolls into time. The time it takes us to get to Mars as humans, it would take us, there's a lot of orbital mechanics and you fly and the rocket goes that's, that's what rockets make for sound. Um, eight, and, eight and a half months later you land on Earth, or I land on Mars after you've left Earth. So, but then you sit on Mars for 15 months as you wait for those planets to line up just right again where you can come back. And then it's another eight and a half months and now you've spent 32 months going to Mars and coming back. That's a long time. We have only have astronauts for, in the space station for six months at a time currently. And this is our 
So first is distance, and then we had time. But now our big problem, the crux of the problem, is humans. Humans are really needy people. We need a lot of resources. 20 tons of water is what we'd need to take to Mars. But the, the resources isn't, isn't the problem. The real problem is what happens to astronauts in the International Space Station. Uh, two weeks ago, March 27th, we launched an astronaut and a cosmonaut on the way to the International Space Station for the first ever 12-month mission. And they will be studying them the entire time over uh, cranial pressures, which causes problems with their eyes. Uh, they usually lose their bones, and 10% uh, of their femur bone is g gone when they come back after six months, and they also have huge muscular problems. So the actual final frontier of space, of space exploration is the human. They are the crux of the problem. Thank you. Well done, Thomas. I imagine you've got a, a question, let me know. <laughs> I, I've got about 30, but I'll just ask yeah. maybe the one. No, really fascinating. I, I'm interested as well on, uh, I, I love the opening, by the way. That's one of the best speeches ever, I yeah. think, if you haven't seen it. I know. It, it's just fantastic. <laughs> like you did it very often. well also, may Thank I say. Um, but in terms of going to Mars, is there a decreasing rationale to send human from Mars, given the way that technology is changing? I mean, what, what, why? 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 Yeah, yeah that's, and that's exactly, that's the, the, always the why. Um, there, there have been studies into it, and it's, people are really confused about how fast art, artificial intelligence is actually building. Not really confused, but they're blown away. So there's some people out there who say, oh, artificial intelligence has to progress at a much faster rate, and then people who say, well, well it is. And so we've, we, we can fly uh, robots there, and so we're working on it right now. We're doing these missions currently, but we might be too late. It's, it's a very good question. We might get to the point where people say, why do we need to send humans? Um, but then there's also the other people who say, we can't support this many people on the world as the population continually grows. So that's kind of a dark side of it. So there's, there's definitely both sides of it, but... Um, and can I just say one thing? Uh, uh, one of the things that JFK did say also was, and return them safely to Earth. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, that's a, a kind of a critical point about go to Mars when you're ready to be able to come back. Yeah, and that was, that was actually that was the, the ending of my speech, but I ran out of time. So uh, <laughs> um, it, at the ending of his speech, he, he says that, um, that he would like to, um, sorry. He said, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on what will be the most hazardous and dangerous but greatest adventure that mankind has ever embarked. And that was just going to the moon. And so had he only known that Mars was going to be this difficult, and if we can bring him back, that's, we can't currently. There's 30, 32 months, we can't do it yet. So. Claire, did you have a question? Yeah, no, not really a question, but just a comment. That was a really yeah. good, thought-provoking talk. And I started to wonder, are they looking at the uh, microbiomes, the gut microbiomes of this, the astronauts on the space station? I'm just uh, wondering what they, it would be like if you were on Mars. I started, I started trying to research. Um, they, have, they currently have seven different um, project top, top things that they're looking at, and then that breaks down, and they, I think they have 32 experiments. And so I actually wrote an email to one of my, the people I worked with, and she took the measurements from Scott Kelly, who's the American astronaut, before yeah. he left on the 27th. Okay. He's and there for a year, isn't he? Yeah, they're all there. The, the two, the astronaut and the cosmonaut, will be there for a year. And so it, it was a big thing. I, I watched the launch, because I'm not a nerd. Um, <laughs> And so you keep saying. Yeah, yep. And I didn't really know he was going to be up there for a year. No, I'm not a nerd. <laughs> All right, uh, Travis Davis, everyone. Yeah. Gillian Murphy is from Cork and completed her degree in applied psychology at UCC. She is currently conducting a uh, uh, PhD in cognitive psychology uh, in driving behavior and getting distracted. Oh, butterfly. Uh, when not in the driving simulation lab, I want to go there, that sounds awesome, uh, she can be found in the dance studio teaching contemporary dance to children and adults. Gillian is going to be talking about paying attention, so pay attention. Uh, there'll be a quiz afterwards. Gillian Murphy, everyone! <clears throat> can looking at a computer screen make your ears stop working? This is a question I ask myself almost every day because I recently moved in with my boyfriend, Aiden, and I love living with him, but <laughs> we've been arguing recently about the third party that we have in our relationship, his PlayStation. 
When Aiden plays the PlayStation, it's like the world around him disappears. He doesn't hear me calling him, he doesn't hear the doorbell. I'm slightly concerned I could be murdered in the house and he may not notice if he was playing the PlayStation. Now, I think he's choosing to ignore me. He says he honestly didn't hear anything. And so I ask myself, can looking at a computer screen make your ears stop working? Being a psychologist, I decided to take a look in Aiden's brain. <laughs> and under normal circumstances, if I called Aiden's name, we would see something like this. So his ears would receive the sound of my voice, send a signal through his brain. This would make him consciously aware of me calling him, and he could answer me. So, so far, domestic bliss in our house. But <laughs> now imagine he's playing the PlayStation, and I call him. Watch what happens to his brain activity now. Not very much at all, really. The signal here is a fraction of what it was before. It's a little bit like turning your phone on silent. The phone is still ringing, but it's much harder for you to detect it. Aiden may be completely unaware that I've said anything, because at a neural level, he's suffering from deafness. The computer screen really has made his ears stop working. So why does this happen? Well, we have a limited amount of attention, and it works across all our senses. So in this case, the PlayStation is placing so much demand on his attention that he simply doesn't have the resources to process the sound of my voice. This is called inattentional deafness, and it's completely involuntary. So if looking at something can make you go deaf, is it possible that listening to something could make you go blind? This might seem mad, but this is something I looked at in my PhD, looking at driving behavior. So I had drivers drive in a driving simulator while listening to a roadwatch on the radio. And their job was to listen out, as many of you probably have, for traffic updates on the M50. <laughs> and I, about halfway through the drive, I had really sneakily placed a huge 30-foot elephant on the footpath. And I afterwards, I asked them had they seen it. And 90% of people listening to the radio fail to see this huge elephant. And again, this is because the radio task took up so much of their attention that they simply didn't have the resources to process what they were seeing, though they likely looked directly at the elephant for a number of seconds. They were blind, and they had no idea it had happened. This seems mad to us, because we think that we see and hear everything that goes on around us. But if we live in a world where a PlayStation can make you deaf and a radio can make you blind, just ask yourself, what else might you have missed today? Thanks. Well done, Julian. Judges. Yeah, I have a question. Um, based on the driving, um, just this is, this is an opinion, what do you think of this? I know that if, if I drive a long distance by myself without the company of the radio or a person, I find myself getting tired. Do you think there's that fine balance to strike between actually staying st stimulated and not on a long journey that's quite boring and monotonous? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I tell a lot of people about, about that study in particular, they go, oh, it's terrible. Why is anyone allowed to listen to a radio? Uh, and you have to say, what would driving be like if you, if you weren't listening to a radio? You know, long haul driving, truckers, things like that. Um, but I think there's a big difference between having the radio on and having all of your attention engaged in the radio. So in that experiment, there was actually two conditions. So in that condition, they were listening out for traffic updates, listening carefully to every word. And in the other condition, they just had to listen to the radio and uh, note the gender of the speaker afterwards. So it was really, really simple. And that's more like the kind of regular listening you'd be doing. So it's kind of, I suppose the take home message is that it's, it's not enough to keep your eyes on the road. You need to keep your whole brain on the road. Rather Sorry, than just excuse your eyes. me. Um, you're saying that <laughs> most people, when they're listening to the radio, the only amount of information they sort of take in <laughs> is the gender of the speaker. Not you, obviously. Obviously not you. No, no, no. So it's safe to listen to the radio when driving, just saying. Very it's it's beneficial, in fact. Yeah. Claire. Can I, be, can I ask three questions? Sorry, I'm going to hide this. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, how did you know what lights, on your amazing prop, how did you know what LED lights to light up when you're listening to the place? Oh, well, they're just as an example. Okay. <laughs> they're not specifically they're not specific. these regions. Okay, no, I'm not wondering. good enough at art or building to actually okay. put them in the right area. But it's kind of a, a, a kind of general quantification of... It generally happens really, really early. So there's a lot of inattentional blindness research and inattentional deafness research that would look at specific brain areas. Uh, and they found that it happens really, really early in the processing. So okay. in visual processing, 
noticing there'd be areas called V1 at the back of your head that it's very, very early. And you notice this change when someone's paying attention to something else. The very earliest signals that we know of are the ones that change, which is really interesting. It's not a late... Yeah. People assume that someone's choosing not to pay attention, but if it happens yeah. that early, it, it's not a choice. Great. So my boyfriend is off the hook. <laughs> good, good. Uh, the second question, do you think you would have got different results if the elephant had moved? Uh, I would say so, okay. because it's a question of kind of salience then and kind of it catching your attention. Exactly. But then there is a lot of studies that would also use kind of flashing checkerboards and things like that, right. because that would produce a very distinctive neural signal, kind of a flashing checkerboard, and they find the same results. Okay. Um, I think possibly too, before people got in the car, it was like, you need to listen to the M50, there's something very important <laughs> happening on the M50. Right. So uh, definitely the fact that they were told, um, you know, there's no consequence of hitting someone in a simulator, whereas yes. you know, in real life driving, you'd imagine it wouldn't be quite as, as severe as that. Fair enough. And finally, did you use any tricks that you know of to keep our attention during this talk? Maybe flashing lights <laughs> would be a good one. <laughs> That's about it. I actually did something uh, not dissimilar to this. We, uh, they, there's a test where you have to count the number of passes between uh, basketball players and a gorilla walks through your field of vision. And people have seen this. So we actually did this in Temple Bar once. And uh, I'd hired some basketball players and the gorilla came through, always going well, and then they dropped the basketball. <laughs> it was as if someone went, there's a gorilla! So it was sort of rude. Uh, <laughs> Jenny and Murphy, everyone. Thanks a lot, Sir Logan Basketball Boys Club. Uh, okay, uh, Aoife is a court girl at heart, but she moved to Dublin's fair city, her words, not mine, to complete a degree in human nutrition followed by a PhD in UCD. Her PhD research looked at the role of high-fat diet in driving obesity and type 2 diabetes. She's passionate about encouraging equal access to third-level education for all in society and has been involved in many outreach initiatives in UCD for disadvantaged students. Her talk is about clocks, so keep an eye on that horn. Uh, TikTok, Aoife Murphy, it is your time to shine. Ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you that all the doors to this room have been locked? Nobody can leave for one month. There are no windows, no lights, and no clocks. We have no idea what time of day it is outside. We are all part of an experiment to explore our inner clocks, which scientists call circadian rhythms. Now, circadian is Latin for about a day. And every living thing, from bacteria to humans, have a network of tiny biological clocks that tick and talk in 24-hour cycles. Our sleeping, our body temperature, hormones, even our physical strength occur in predictable daily rhythms. In fact, most of the Olympic world records have been broken in the evening, the time in our circadian clocks where we are at our peak physical fitness. And when we are at our peak physical fitness. Um, and all of these clocks can be reset. So we do this by light. But in a dark room like this, we will follow these daily rhythms religiously. Even a morning glory plant will open and close its leaves in the dark. So, we have evolved to rise with the sun. And how does this work? Well, in the morning, when photoreceptors in our eyes detect light, they send signals to a small group of cells in our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Smaller than a pea, this is our master clock, and it puts all of the other clocks in sync. So we are all in sync for morning time. Our sleep hormone melatonin goes down, our body temperature and heart rate goes up. We are reset for the day. However, the 20th century brought the dawn of artificial light. Artificial light is wreaking havoc with our body clocks and our health. Artificial light is causing our days to become longer, and we are trying to cram more and more things into our lives, when in fact this could be shortening them. So, think of a nurse on her third night shift in a row. She is fighting the clock in order to protect our health. Fighting the clock like this 
is putting her at risk of diseases like depression, insomnia, and diabetes. And scientists have found that we can actually use this clock in a good way. We can choose the time of day in our circadian clock that medicines work. And arthritis is the best example for this. Patients with arthritis are best treated at nighttime for their, their inflammation and their pains in the morning. So ladies and gentlemen, when I unlock the doors to this room and you all frolic off into the sunlight, remember, forget the lights, forget your watch, just listen to the tick-tock of your inner circadian clock. Judges, you have two minutes exactly. <laughs> Quick question then. Um, wh why do we need sleep? Uh, wh what's the purpose of having the circadian clock? In, in, yeah, what's the purpose? So we, we wake and sleep in regular 24 hour cycles, and our sleep is required for us, our body, to shut down and repair itself. So when we sleep, our immune system goes down, our body temperature goes down, and we start to repair everything that we've been damaging throughout the day from the environment. And lack of sleep is causing a lot of these diseases, like, is linked to a lot of these diseases like diabetes and obviously insomnia and things like that. So sleep is a very, very important uh, part of our lives. Yeah. And just a quick follow-on mm -hmm. question. Is, is it a, so is it, you know, this business of the eight hours sleep, is that, uh, why eight? I mean, obviously, if you think about the natural cycles during the summer, uh, the sun rises early and sets late, and in the winter, it's quite different. So you've got yeah. a, an eight-hour time difference in the length of day between, between summer and winter. How, how did our body... Yeah, well, it is thought that we evolved near the equator as a human race. So we had practically 12 hours of light and then 12 hours of dark. And the... We spent all of our day bright and active, and then when the, the lights started going down and dark, this is when we start producing melatonin in our, our brains and it starts making us sleepy. So we would have, it would take a couple of hours into the dark for this to happen, and then we would sleep for the eight hours, and then the sun would rise again. So eight hours is the best amount of time to get. Can I just ask, um, my, my understanding of it is that different, um, different wavelengths of light have different effects on the super, super chiasmatic, the SCN. Yeah. Super uh, chiasmatic nucleus so SBL, I do <laughs> so so That one, that, the, the, little, the little guy in there. Feedback um, doesn't like the joke. <laughs> and I mean, these, these emit a lot of blue light. So how yeah. soon before bed should we stop looking <coughs> at these screens? We should stop looking, well, I'm not exactly sure exactly how long, but we shouldn't be looking at our smartphones before bed, laptops, TVs, all these Netflix binges. We should try to maybe three to four hours beforehand to let our body start to shut down naturally and produce its melatonin, because the blue light in the phone is the same as the blue light that the sun emits. So if you were sitting in front of a fire, this would emit red light, and it wouldn't keep you awake as long as the blue light in our phones and laptops. So you're saying three to four hours off the internet before bed. If, if first just, you just invent a time hands. machine at the yeah, back of the 1980s. Yeah, shut down. Eva Murphy, everyone. Thank you. Our final speaker is Kevin Motherway. He studied for a BSc in geology in University College Cork and then went to UCL, University College London, and gained an MSc in hydrogeology, which sounds like a drunk person saying hydrology, but Kevin assures me it's a real thing. Uh, for the last nine years, Kevin has worked with the EPA on many aspects of protecting our natural resources. He's a keen amateur astronomer and planetary geologist, and a bit obsessed with exploring the universe. Being a native of the promised land of Cork, what is it with you people? Uh, <laughs> Kevin still lives and works there and has no desire to leave unless it's for an off-planet excursion. From the EPA, it's Kevin Motherway. <laughs> I'm faced with a life or death choice. I'm a geologist about to explore the solar system, and I've got to decide, do I want to take an extra litre of water for safety or my geological hammer? Well, let's compare the merits. Water is like the Swiss army knife of, Swiss army knife of space exploration. It's H2O, hydrogen that I can use as rocket fuel, oxygen that I can breathe. I can recombine the two 
in a fuel cell that will give me electricity and also give me liquid water to keep myself hydrated, rehydrate food, and maybe even grow some food on the way. But what's the point in taking all these provisions on our journey if we can't do any science when we get there? So which one are we going to leave behind? Well, I say we've got to learn to leave the water behind. We've got to learn to live off the land. Now, not in a Bear grills. come on, we'll jump off the cliff, it'll be a bit of crack sort of way. I'm talking about mapping the water resources of the solar system and planning our trips very carefully. And it turns out that understanding how particles behave in collisions is the way that we might do it. <laughs> now, that collision there, it wasn't the member of the audience, it was a pollen grain that hit and flew to the back of the room. But that ball kept going with the same momentum after the collision because there was a huge contrast in the mass of the particles. Just like when I try and collide the particle with the mass of the entire building, that particle keeps going. It doesn't lose its velocity because there's a huge difference in the mass. But watch what happens when I collide is with something of exactly the same mass. It doesn't go as far at all. It's lost a huge amount of its momentum. It's transferred its velocity very effectively. And when we're looking for water, many of the places we're going to look are barren and desolate, like the surface of the moon. But these are places that are constantly bombarded by gamma rays, cosmic rays, that liberate neutrons in the lunar soil. Now, most of them ping off dense iron and silicon and oxygen and mag magnesium, the ingredients of basalt. And when they ping around like they're in a pinball machine and then come up to out into space, we can measure the velocity. And they're fast, energetic neutrons. But when we fly over certain areas, like the poles and craters that are in permanent darkness, what we find is the neutrons have slowed way down. They've been through multiple collisions with something of exactly the same mass. Now, the most abundant thing in the universe is hydrogen, proteum as we call it, because it's one proton and one electron. Now, the weight of the electron, you can forget it. It's like the weight of the, my fingerprints on this ball. So probably what's happened is that those neutrons have collided with multiple hydrogen atoms. It can't be hydrogen gas, because that would be long gone. It must be bound up with something else, which is oxygen, H2O. So find the slow neutrons, you find the water. I know what I'm not leaving home. <laughs> If you can file your personal injury lawsuits directly to Kevin, please, we're not covered. Make the questions easy, please. <laughs> uh, judges? Definitely the best so far. Um, that was a joke, by the way, because I'm a judge. Um, the, the neutrons, is there another way? I mean, if, if there's lots of neutrons being emitted simultaneously, could that slow them down as a thing from interacting with water, since neutron, based upon your... Absolutely. I mean, at the heart of every atom is a, is a proton and a neutron. But the most abundant particle in the universe are protons, because the, the universe is practically made of hydrogen, 99%. So that's protium, it's mostly protons. So just on probability alone, what is that particle impacting with? Probability says it's going to be a hydrogen atom. And it's the, not just the count of proteins rising up from the surface of the moon or whatever body we're exploring, it's the velocity at which we're detecting them. And if they've slowed way down, that's the critical thing. It's their velocity and how many, par how many collisions they've been through and what they've been colliding with. And may I ask a question? Why would you not say, for example, use infrared spectroscopy just to, to look for the water, just you know, shine, a, shine a light on it and just excite it and see what you get back? Why go with the neutrons? Well, what you're talking about there is you're sending out, just like we've lights hitting me and reflecting it so the audience can see me, you're talking about sending out a beam and getting it reflected back. What I'm saying is you're getting this done for free because gamma rays are already bombarding the surface, liberating those neutrons for us, and they're coming up for free. We just have to sit back and listen. We don't have to actively send out a ping. Kevin Motherway, everyone. Well done. All right, they are our 11 uh, speakers. Uh, just to give you a quick run through, um, we had Donald Earls, uh, we had uh, Lisa Murphy, who was talking about selfies, we had uh, uh, Jennifer Lorigan, who uh, was uh, talking about uh, viral gene therapy, uh, Rory Robertson, who was uh, talking about your first coat, uh, Trace Jane Cassidy was talking about the parasite. Anya Flood uh, was talking about uh, conduction. Travis Davis uh, was talking about uh, going to Mars. 
uh, Gillian was talking about um, driving simulation and paying attention and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Aoife Murphy was talking about your circadian rhythm and Kevin Motherway, uh, you just heard talking uh, about his space rock hammer. Uh, okay, uh, there is a, a, a prize for the audience decision, so please do fill out um, your forms in order uh, and we'll collect those from you. Uh, judges, we will give you 20 minutes to deliberate and if you can come back right about then, last year it was about 30 minutes and I really had to fail. I haven't got so. that much material. <laughs> uh, so uh, please give all of our participants a big round of applause, please. Thank you, judges. Okay, so this um, uh, we've got five minutes um, uh, before Mark Looney uh, starts. Mark Looney was the first ever Fame Lab winner. Uh, he's a physics guitarist, which I'm very excited to see what that means. Uh, he has traveled the world uh, talking about science. He's been to Tokyo, the Montreux Jazz Festival, Hull. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, so this period is uh, usually an opportunity for me to promote the things that I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, as I have a captive audience. Uh, so I wanted, to, I wanted to get a raise of hands. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit either about the, who wants to hear about the total solar eclipse I was on? Uh, or the, the other one is uh, uh, the, the biohacker who gave himself night vision. So night vision, raise your hands. Okay, and uh, total solar eclipse? I, I can't count. <laughs> it's probably, I'll do the total, huh? Biohacker, okay, someone seems to be very cute. Okay, so, um, uh, this Saturday um, at 10 a.m. on News Talk, uh, we'll be playing an interview with a guy called Ga Gabriel Lissina, who's an organization, he's from an organization called Science for the Masses. Uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, kind of walking in the steps of, uh, of a long tradition of self-experimentation. So, what Gabriel's done is, uh, he read some studies and he put two and two together and came up with a pretty nifty idea. So um, Gabriel looked at uh, deep sea fish and uh, looked at uh, a particular compound uh, that gives them the ability to see better in deep dark waters. Uh, and he noticed that some people had put this compound into rats and it went to their eyes. So uh, he, 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 thought that, he thought that was quite interesting. Uh, and then he saw that someone else had looked at uh, this particular material and, uh, and actually um, put it on top of rat's eyes to see how they could see. And um, he decided, uh, when he looked at the, all the material, that it would take forever to do an ethics uh, study. So uh, when people want to do an experiment, either on animals or on human beings, uh, they have to go through this boring process called the ethics um, a, a process. Right. So they have to ask, you know, uh, answer the sort of questions like, uh, is anyone going to get hurt? Or is anyone's feelings, you know, going to be hurt by this? Uh, and then the valid one of, you know, will animals get hurt? Uh, so what he decided to do is bypass all of that and uh, get a friend of his to uh, come up with an eye drop solution to put into his eyes himself, because you can't can't really stop someone from experimenting on themselves and uh, the reason we know that it's not stress that gives us um, our ulcers but actually a bacteria is because someone decided they couldn't wait for all of the ethics and they decided to experiment themselves. So uh, I spoke to him this morning and uh, he was telling me about the, the entire process. So what they did was, um, because you need to see really well when you're putting a sort of dodgy concoction into someone's eyes, uh, they had a bright room, so Gabriel had to wear uh, protective lenses over his eyes, uh, which made him look a little bit like Riddick with the black eyes, which looks really cool in photographs, so that probably did well to get a bit of the press. And then uh, he got um, his, uh, his colleague Jeff Tibbetts to administer the eye drops into his eyes. Uh, and then he waited. So he said it wasn't really that painful. The only thing that was painful was the speculum, which uh, ladies who have been through some rather un unfortunate um, circumstances may, may be familiar with. But it's a thing that can also open your eyes. Um, and so <laughs> and what, what they found was uh, that after a couple of hours, this solution actually does kick in. Um, and so, uh, as all good scientists do, he went to a very dark forest and played uh, laser tag with some people uh, who couldn't see. They all received minor injuries from bumping into trees, uh, but he genuinely actually changed his ability to see in night vision. Uh, he was able to spot uh, not just figures, but uh, uh, marks on a balloon from 50, feet, 50 meters away where people were in a forest so dark they couldn't see their own feet. Um, so we're going to be talking to him tomorrow. He's a very, uh, on Saturday, he's a very interesting guy. Um, how are you doing? I'm ready. Oh, you're ready? Okay, well, there. that was easy. That was perfectly timed. Uh, if you can please hand your forms together to Liz and then put your hands together for Mark Looney. <laughs>
So, uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Looney. That is my real name. If you're, uh, if you're born with a surname like that, you've got to do a PhD, right? It's, it's kind of rude not to. So, uh, I won the very first FameLab uh, in Cheltenham Science Festival in 2005 when I had much more hair. Um, and since then, I've been all over the world doing this kind of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's uh, you know, science has kind of got a bit cool now, hasn't it? You know, Brian Cox is brilliant, it's billions. He's all over the show. Uh, there's loads of science on, like, BBC Four and uh, all over the place. Back in 2005, there was nothing right except Horizons. So, do you, you're familiar with Horizons? Uh, there's a lot of science programmes that are very, very like it, right? Uh, so we got rid of like Tomorrow's World. There was all, there was almost no science on telly, um, and Horizons was okay. But the trouble with Horizons is it's made for non-scientists, and almost everyone who watched it was a scientist. There's just a lot more of them than they thought, and the uh, the way scientists watch Horizons is basically like a Wikipedia page that loads very slowly. We just oh get on with it. Uh, so I've found out a new way to watch Horizons, right? It's, it's great. What you do, you put the subtitles on and watch it at ten times the speed. <laughs> and you know what? It's just as good. You, you get just as much stuff out. All the artwork, and you don't, you don't need that. So I'm going to give you my, um, my little experience of Horizons. I'm going to do an average... <laughs> an average Horizons episode in six minutes. You ready? It begins with people walking around out of focus. Possibly in Times Square or Shinjuku Station, or usually on the Millennium Bridge by St. Paul's Cathedral. The narrator asks you to imagine if some little aspect of reality was slightly different. Now, most of the time, it would just remain a completely normal world. But what if... a note of dissonance appears. What if the consequences weren't so insignificant? The dissonance grows. In fact, what if the consequences were very significant indeed? The crescendo suddenly stops. replaced by pleasant music in a major key. Some scientist is introduced who does some science somewhere. They're shown driving to work on a sunny day. This is because most science these days is done on a computer, so driving to work is the most televisually exciting thing they do all day. The scientist smiles and introduces their work in a friendly and non-threatening manner. Apparently the research was going very well. That is until... Ooh. appears. There was an error or anomaly. The scientist hoped it would go away, but it didn't. It got bigger. Eventually it got so big that it threatened to overturn established theory. And the scientists worried that if they published the anomalous result, all the other scientists would think they were a bit of a knobhead. 
pleasant music returns, slightly different this time. Oh, here we go again. I'll tell you what, I'll just do it all through one amp. How's that? <laughs> oh yeah, we're there. A different scientist is introduced who does some very different science somewhere very far away from the first. Apparently their research was going very well as well. That is until a different anomaly appeared in their results. This scientist all were also worried that the rest of the scientists would think they were an idiot. That is until the first scientist heard about the second scientist's result. The music is now urgent and invigorating. Could there be a link between the two lines of research? Of course there could, you wouldn't have made the program otherwise, duh. More and more evidence is to produced to show how the second scientist's result could explain the first scientist's anomaly. Expensive computer graphics distract you from the speculative nature of the synthesis, which is presented as being extremely promising. Finally, a resounding major chord heralds the new breakthrough. Everything looks peachy, but there's still 20 minutes left. <laughs> the narrator comes back and asks you to imagine one particular aspect of the new theory. At first, it wouldn't seem to be very significant, but suddenly, Another note of dissonance appears. Everything would be fine if we stopped playing flattened fifths. Apparently, some of the consequences could be quite dangerous. The music is now disturbing and unsettling. The narrator sounds like he's reading a piece by H.P. Lovecraft. The first signs of danger would appear, but no one would listen to the scientists. Oh no! Things would get worse and worse and worse. The camera work becomes shaky. Harsh glissandros appear, like Day in the Life by the Beatles. An enraged chimp goes in and out of focus for no reason at all. Finally, an entire city is shown being destroyed by a wave or an asteroid or a massive bear. I don't know, just make it scary, all right? The crescendo suddenly disappears. The narrator says, of course, all of this probably won't happen. The final chord before the credits is left unresolved. And the narrator says, but it might. Okay, can we switch uh, thingy? Right, uh, so, I work, uh, Fame Lab is usually about uh, all talking, no PowerPoint, right? I won the first one, so I can do completely the opposite. I'm gonna do all PowerPoint and no talking, right? Uh, but that's a, that's a real street sign in Orkney in Scotland, right? So I don't, I'm not making that up. So I'm gonna do my version of a famous song uh, that's not a spelling mistake. David Bohm is a famous quantum uh, physicist. Um, and you won't get all the jokes in this. Uh, this is the geekiest version of this song you've ever heard. Don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm kind of used to that. Uh, but you've got, two, you, you've got two duties, right? First, you've all got to nod your heads in time in the middle. Right? You, you'll know the bit. At the end, you've all got to make the sound of a gong. Everyone make the sound of a gong for me. Now, don't just say the word gong. Uh, 
in a deep voice. If I said, make the sound of a glockenspiel, you go, glockenspiel. Right? Everyone, everyone go with this. Excellent. All right. Oh, she's going to be bad. Ah, it's this lead. Ah, I got it. All right. Shut up. It's the lead I didn't bring with me. Nice. Right, let's go. Okay. laughing so <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
that's actually true. <laughs> That all night. Really <laughs> right, remember your gong. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you okay? <laughs> Are you ready? Well, then that was great. Judges ready? Um, that's a good question as well. That's my job, isn't it? My it really is. Well, well, no, I'll usually they you do the fill in. Have you got more? Uh, I've got, I could do another three minutes if they need it. Yeah, go on. Do you want more three more minutes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, right, so I'll try and remember. Uh, have, have a little, have a little look. Let's see if they're there. What do, what do they need? They need three minutes. That's excellent. <laughs> so I'm going to try and remember I'll just hold the, door the three me. minutes I won with. Uh, Eight years ago. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, what the hell did I do? Okay. <laughs> Eddie Van Halen there from a song called Hot for Teacher. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Obviously never saw my teacher. But so, hello, uh, I'm going to explain the physics of rock guitar. How come when I hear a... I just can't get no... Or is it about this stuff, this equipment, that causes that revolutionary history-changing sound? Uh, to understand the sound of rock guitar, first you've got to have a look at the string. Uh, I'd like you to think of a string uh, as kind of uh, as long stretched out <laughs> spring. Uh, now the frequencies of a stretched spring uh, depend on three things, okay? Just the simple side-to-side -side fundamental mode of the string. Depends on three things. Firstly, the length, the shorter, the higher. So when I put my finger on a fret, I shorten the length of the string so the frequency rises. <laughs> Secondly, tension. The looser, the lower. When I press down my whammy bar, I decrease the tension in the string so the frequency drops. <laughs> and then finally, thickness. All of these strings are the same length and the same tension. It's just the lower pitched ones are thicker. And to get really low notes, they've got to be really thick which curiously also applies to bassists. <laughs> uh, apologies to bassists in the audience. You're an easy target for guitarists. I'm sorry for my uh, institutionalized bassism. Uh, so that's not the only pattern of vibration that's possible. There's this one. Hang on. Uh, there's this one. And there's this one. These are the harmonics, okay? So if I rest my finger halfway along the string, so it vibrates either side of my finger, I hear the harmonic of the, fir the first harmonic. Fundamental, first harmonic. If I rest my finger closer to the end of the string, a third of the way along, I hear the harmonic of the second kind. Closer again, I encounter the third kind. Uh, and the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. I can never get a ninth. Uh, so when I pluck a string, I excite all of these different patterns of vibration at once. Okay, that gives the string its higher frequency content. Uh, trouble with strings is they're very quiet on their own. Just the string alone doesn't make much sound. Uh, but this is a metal string, okay? And these little circles here are the ends of magnets. 
And if you wrap wires around a magnet, anyone know what you get when you move metal near a magnet? Electricity. You induce an electrical signal. So for each of those harmonics, the metal string induces a sine wavy signal in the wires wrapped around these magnets that come out the lead of the guitar. So all of those signals is they're very weak. What has to happen is they're sent to an amplifier. Uh, let's point to the one that works. Uh, that takes alternating current from the mains, turns it into direct current, <laughs> ACDC, <laughs> and uses that current to boost these incredibly weak signals. And the trouble with that is they're very fragile. It's very difficult to keep that nice sine wavy shape as we boost the depth, the amplitude of the signal. Guitarists in the 1960s started turning the volume up past the limits of the amplifier. Oh yes, up to 11. <laughs> and that started squashing the top of the sine waves, made them more like square waves. And you know what? The squashed waves sounded cool. That squashed top gave each harmonic harmonics of its own. Those false electronic harmonics started getting their own false electronic harmonics until eventually plucking the string caused a huge rich cascade of new frequencies. That cascade of harmonics turned the simplest riff into something powerful. <laughs> You could get great results without requiring great expertise. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Uh, add to that the fact that it's so economically cheap just to put some wood and magnets together so anyone can afford it, and bullseye. <laughs> You've got the sound of a revolution. So the sound of rock guitar isn't a kind of magic. <laughs> It's just simple physics. Thank you, Dublin! Thanks a lot. Mark Uni, everyone! That was brilliant. I, I, I was going to have a rabbit on there for three minutes. Much better you did that. Well done. Uh, okay, uh, congratulations to everyone who's taken part, but it is that very exciting time of the evening. I'll just pause for a dramatic effect. Um, so we have our judges back, uh, and if we can welcome them back, please, please put your hands together for Jenny Hill, Claire O'Connell, and Niall Smith. Uh, and so what we'll do is uh, we will announce the winners in reverse order, uh, and we'll start off with the audience prize. Uh, we'll ask Niall, as the chair, no sexism thing, this is all judged, right? He's just, just the tallest, uh, to give out the prize. So, uh, uh, well done, audience. You chose a, a great speaker. Uh, the winner of the audience prize is Gillian Murphy. Thank you. Well done, Gillian. Stay up on stage here if you don't mind, just kind of find some space there and try not to trip because you're quite tall, you probably knock the whole thing down. Um, second place, oh sorry, third place was Gillian Murphy. <laughs> second place goes to Gillian Murphy. <laughs> Rory Robertson. <laughs> and tonight's Fame Lab Ireland 2015 winner who will be heading out to Cheltenham uh, to perform in the national final. You know where she's from. It's Lisa Murphy. <laughs> Well done, you did a great talk.
Well done. Uh, can we have number nine on, please? Would you mind just saying a, a little uh, something, Lisa, about uh, having one? Um, well, I'm from Cork, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just I'm so in shock. Uh, myself and Gillian have really been rehearsing just non-stop for the last um, few days and few weeks, and I just really, really want to thank um, the judges because I really didn't expect to win. I just wanted to just enter it just to try and kind of give myself as much experience in public speaking as I could because I actually um, find it really difficult um, not to shake and things like that when um, I'm publicly speaking. So i just like to say thank you so, so much. And um, you're also a great audience. And the guitar physicist was amazing. The <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody was unbelievable. Um, but this has been probably like one of the best experiences of my life. The masterclass that we got to go to as well um, with Jonathan here and Malcolm Love was just amazing that like the skills we learned were so great and so valuable and they really stood to me here so just thank you so much <laughs> we didn't do anything well done <laughs> well done to our winners and again another big round of applause for our participants thank you so much for everyone to take part Thanks, of course, to our judges, all of our partners, uh, and the British Council, of course, who put on uh, Fame Lab. It's going to be a very exciting uh, trip over to Cheltenham. Uh, we'll be covering it on Future Proof, so you can hear all about how Lisa Murphy does before and after winning the final three out of four prizes. Cork won. You must be delighted with yourself. Oh, yeah. Up Cork. Good night and thank you. <laughs>